Amen. Let's worship the Lord. You guys happy to be here? Yeah. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my doom till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures, I tried. It was my turn till I met you. You called my name. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. Cause I search the world, it couldn't fail me. Cause man's in depressed. Never enough, thank you, Lord. And you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing. I'm not 
weakness My failures and flaws Lord, you see them all And you still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley And there's not a place Your mercy and grace won't find me again Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you There's nothing There's nothing is better than you Oh, there's nothing
until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause all my If you need a communion element, please raise your hand and one will be brought to you. One of my spiritual fathers, he said he, when he was on, he was next to his mom on her deathbed and she was in her 90s and she had a really rough life. She was abandoned in the hospital by her parents and she was adopted and she went through a lot of really tough, tough times. Husband died, you know, far too young and she had to raise three kids, two really wild, and one seeking God. And, but you know, on her deathbed, all she had to say was, oh, God has been so good to me all of my life. 
She only remembered the goodness of God, all the good things. And you know, that's how we overcome the enemy. The Bible says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. The more you talk about the goodness of God, his blessings, that'll make them come on you and overtake you. But you can stop them if you're speaking death. Amen. On God's side, there is no holding back. He's like this dam full of all these good things, and he's just ready to release it. But they're released by our words that we speak life. We speak of the goodness of God. God has been so good to me. And you say, oh, you just help people. He's been so good to me. God, and you just remember all the good things and the goodness of God. And man, that just blesses the Lord. It blesses God so much. It blesses him that you're partaking of what we're about to partake of, the communion, what Jesus did on the cross for us. Resurrection Day should be celebrated every day. And the more you celebrate the finished work of the cross, the more that inheritance and those blessings, they're going to show up in your life. Amen. Coming from somebody who was just depressed and, and suicidal for all my teenage years until I learned to change the way I saw God and think positive. And then life began to show up. Good things began to show up in my life. Have you guys ever heard of that verse? Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Do you know that that verse is no longer applicable to the believer on this side of the cross? And I wish I would have known that because one night I was in so much despair. I kept checking the clock. And honestly, I kept taking um, like Somnix, something to help me sleep. By the time morning came, I had taken 10 because I just couldn't sleep. And, and I just kept taking them. And, and I kept saying that verse, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And I kept waiting for the daybreak and waiting for the daybreak. And I just sunk deeper and deeper. But then I found out the truth. And by the way, I never slept. I was just awake all night long. And you find out the truth that Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says that we already have joy on this side of the cross. We, already, we don't have to weep. Jesus wept on the cross for us. Amen. He bore all our sorrow, all our pain. And now that I know that, I just transfer that. That's how you cast your care. And this is what communion is all about because we've been joined to God. We are one spirit with him. One third of me is wall to wall Holy Ghost. One third of me is living out heaven from the inside out. You know, I used to ask God for so many things and then you got to wait and see. But all the promises of God are yes and amen. Now I speak to my situation. Now I tell my body to be healed, to be whole, to be free. I talk to my finances. I speak to the situation. And you know what? The results are so much faster yeah. because I was doing it wrong. Amen. And that's scriptural. That's Mark 11, 22 and 23. God is so awesome. What he's done for us, what Jesus has done for us on the cross is so amazing. Don't believe the lie. Things changed when Jesus died on the cross. All the blessings came through. He died a curse. Amen. He, he crucified and he killed the curse. Uh, this morning I was meditating on Romans 8 and it says where he made him he became a human being and in that flesh on the cross he condemned sin in the flesh he defeated our enemy thank you jesus when he defeated sin he defeated the devil and everything that was inside of sin sickness disease despair loss hopelessness he conquered it that's why we are more than conquerors through him who loved us amen oh we're gonna celebrate that I tell you, I've never had a depressing day since I understood these truths. Instead of wanting to end my life, I just want to live and tell everybody of the goodness of God. Amen. You don't have to wait anymore. People were retrieving what the cross was going to bring in the future before the cross even came. They were raising the dead. They were living in divine health. Amen. How much more should we on this side of the cross? Oh, God is so good. If you're sick, you don't have to be. Amen. Jesus bore all our sickness. That's Matthew 8. Have some verses to help you, okay? Romans 8. Uh, I'm sorry, I say Matthew 8. 
I think it's 17b. It says, surely he's born, um, I'm sorry, he carried all our diseases and our sicknesses. Amen. He bore that on the cross. He took them down into hell. Let's come into agreement with him. Amen. Let's receive of that inheritance. Let's go ahead and break the bread and go ahead and partake. Lord, thank you for taking this sickness, whatever is coming against you. Thank him for taking it. You took depression. You took hopelessness. You took sorrow. You took everything. Thank you, Lord. And the blood that he shed to cleanse our conscience from all sin. You know, whatever you're conscious of, it's going to have power in your life. Amen. If you're thinking about that sickness, if you're thinking about that addiction, or you're thinking about that unforgiveness, that is going to rule and reign in your life. But if you think about what the cross paid, Jesus paid for all that as if it happened to him, as if it was done to him, as if he was the one that committed those acts. He covered everything. Let's just go ahead and release that to him and thank him. Go ahead and partake. Lord, thank you for freeing us from guilt, shame, condemnation, and sickness and disease and the power of the enemy. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Hello, everyone. We're going to get started with glory stories. Um, We have a few that I was reading that I just thought were amazing. Um, remember, we do glory stories because when we share our testimony, we're saying, it's God saying through us that I want to do it again. And, um, and we really enjoy reading them. I, I love, I'm like excited to check my emails every week to see um, what God is doing in your guys' lives. So the first one we have here is on Saturday, April 1st, I was standing in the backyard and I felt a sharp pain in my back. I couldn't move for several minutes. I had to run a few errands that day and I couldn't walk without limping. The sharp pain I was battling started in my back and continued straight to my right leg. I took a visit to the doctors and all they wanted to give me was pain medications. I refused to take them. Tuesday was the day that I went to the doctor. The pain was so bad, but I kept praying and telling it to go in Jesus' name and the next day the pain wasn't there. Praise God. Remember, you speak to your mountain. Don't ask God. You tell it. On April 14th, I was healed of a long time weight that was on my shoulders. I had a lot of resentment toward my family since 2017. I had been seeking God all last year and this year, believing for healing in a lot of areas. And one of the areas was resentment and unforgiveness. On Friday, late at night, I could not sleep. And so I put on worship music and I started worshiping to it. I began reading how Jesus opened the eyes of the blind man, and as I prayed for God to open my eyes, it was like a rushing wind filled my room and my heart and flood my heart and flooded my body. The resentment and unforgiveness I felt for the last six years were lifted off of me. My whole body felt the love of God, and just like that, I was healed. I have been freed from resentment and unforgiveness. Now I know that my family wants the best for me. God is so good. Praise God. Someone say glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Isn't he so good? If he can do that for for them, who else can he do it for? Thank you, Lord. I always think, you know, the enemy, he he likes to come against you when you're at your, your highest point sometimes. But then he likes to come against you at your lowest point, just to remind you that he's still around. But I love what God Every time I think about our Lord and how I think about his creation, the scripture says that all of creation is showing his, his goodness. It's evidence of his goodness. Amen? And whenever I think about that, I start thinking about how he created us. And man, God created us as Adam and Eve in the, in the garden for the very first time. And we were, he created us perfect. And I keep thinking, God has never changed anything about his creation. Never. He created it once, and on the seventh day, he rested and said, it's good. It's, it's very good. I, I'm done. It's, it's complete. And I think about what that means and how it, it's relating. I like to relate it to where a painter is painting his, his canvas, and he's finished all of the, the trees and He painted all the mountains and the sky and the little pond. And then he puts his paintbrush down. 
he rested. Now, he didn't rest because if it was just one more stroke, he, would, he couldn't do it and he'd get so tired. No, he, the painter rests because one more stroke of that paint would ruin it. It's perfect. Leave it alone. It's done. And that's what, what creation was like. God, he created the heavens and the earth. He created us. He created the animals, all of nature. And then when he saw that everything was very good, he said, nothing else or else it would be imperfect. It's perfect the way it is. And so he's never created another animal. He's never created another tree. Think about it. Have you ever seen a cow just pop out of nowhere? Just come out of nowhere? No, because he already did that. He's done. He, he created it. And everything since the garden has been reproduced after its own kind. Praise God. And here's the crazy part. God created Adam and Eve in the garden as perfect beings. No sin in the world yet. However, he still created the human body to heal itself even when there is no sin in the garden. He already provided before there was a need for the provision. He already provided. Those of you who are sick in your body or you're feeling a symptom or the enemy is trying to attack you, know this, God already created your body to heal itself, praise God, before sin even entered the world. And whenever I think about that, I think, man, he thought ahead so much. He thought ahead. And that's how good our God is. If you were here last week, man, I preached a message that will forever be a great message. Because it was about the goodness of God. It wasn't what I said. It wasn't because I was speaking it. It was because it was about the goodness of God. That's all it was about. And, and people will think that God is such a harsh God and, and he's so mean to people. And, oh, look, look at the Old Testament. The Old Testament's filled with his judgment. Sure, there's a lot of pages in here that's filled with his judgment and wrath. But did you know that from the time of Adam and Eve's sin until the very first law was introduced was 2,000 years? In other words... God did not hold their sin accountable or didn't hold them accountable for their sin for nearly 2,000 years. And then the law came. Then the law reigned for 2,000 years. Then Jesus came. Then Jesus died on the cross, defeated sin and death and rose again. And here we are 2,000 years later living in the day of grace. So here's the truth. There is God's judgment in the Old Testament, absolutely. But life as we know it has seen more of God's goodness and grace than it has of God's wrath and judgment. That's the truth right there. And if we just rethink, that sounds familiar, right? Renewing your mind. If we just change the way we think about God and who he is, He's not a God of wrath and judgment, although he did have that in the Bible. The majority of our entire existence has seen his goodness more than his wrath. We got to flip the table. We got to show the goodness. Amen. And he is so good to us. It's offering time this morning. Just wanted to share that with you before we got into offering. It's offering time. And man, the Lord's been so good. I love hearing those glory stories of people. Um, there's glory stories in finances too. If God's done anything good in your finances, that's worthy of sharing his glory. Amen. Just personally, the Lord just blessed us so much in our personal finances and our personal life. He, he's been really good to us, to, to me and my wife personally, not through the church. And uh, he's just been so good. If he can do it for us, he can do it for you. We're not special. We don't have a double anointing. We're, we're just the average Joe that God put his spirit inside of. And you too, you are just an average Joe who God put his spirit inside of. And if he can do it for us, he can do it for you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. If you have your Bibles today, there's a scripture I want to show you in Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. 
in verse 24, what if I told you there is a prescription to increase? Would you take it? I mean, you take what the doctor prescribes you, so why wouldn't you take what God prescribes you? Uh-oh. Don't leave now. I'm preaching good. Proverbs 11, 24, the scripture says, there is one who scatters. Someone say scatters. scatters. Yet he increases more. That doesn't make no sense. He scatters, but he increases more. Then there's one who withholds more than is right. Notice it says he withholds more than it's right. So the Bible also tells me here that it's okay to withhold. Just don't withhold more than is right. That's what it says right here. He's withholding more than is right. So don't, don't fall into the temptation that most Christians have where they say you have to get rid of everything. God doesn't want you to have anything. Get rid of all of it. Because most of those people aren't even living by what they preach. Because they, they, don't, they don't give. They're not givers. They're against the whole tithe. They're against the whole offering. And, but they'll still preach God wants you to get rid of everything that you own. There is one who scatters, yet he increases more. There is one who withholds more than, it, than, than is right, but it leads to what? Say poverty. So which one leads to poverty? The one who gives it all away or the one who holds all of it? Doesn't that sound weird? To the world, the one who gives it all away is the one who leads to poverty. That's why the world doesn't like to give. There's one who scatters, yet he increases more. Go to the next verse, that's all right. The generous soul will be made rich. Someone say rich. Man, that's another, that's the R word that Christians don't like to say either. Rated R. Rich. He who waters will also be watered himself. The next verse in 26 says, The people will curse him who withholds grain, but blessing will be on the head of him who sells it. Now, I, I even love this scripture so much too, because the Bible is not even saying for him who gives it away is blessed. It's the one who sells it is blessed. The whole purpose, the point that's trying to be made right here is to just be generous with what you have, whether it's selling something or giving it away, share it with people. Let other people have access to it. Amen? That's what it's saying here. But the prescription, it's God's method of increase. If you are lacking in your life for whatever reason, if financially you're, you're struggling to make ends meet or you're barely, barely paying paycheck to paycheck, the method of increase that God has prescribed to each and every one of us is to sow the seed. And I love that he relates this to farming and farmers. We live in farm country where, the, where we feed the entire world with our agriculture. We're in a blessed, blessed place. I love this place. This, Tulare County feeds majority of the world just because of our agriculture. That is so awesome. And I love that we live here because I see this so clearly. I see these illustrations and these parables of Jesus, of the sower seed, so clearly because of where we live. That when a farmer scatters seed, that means he's planting the seed. What happens when you plant the seed, water it, and let it grow? You get a harvest. And that's what he's relating it to. When you scatter the seed, he, there's one who scatters, yet he increases. He plants the seed, he scatters the seed, and from those seeds that he sowed, a harvest came. And that's what it's like in the kingdom of God when we give. When we give, we give into good ground. Amen. We give into ground that's fertile. We give into ground that'll produce a beautiful harvest. But what's the whole purpose of prosperity? To give to others. To be able to bless someone else. That's the whole purpose. So when people are, are mad at prosperity preachers for having a lot of money and they think that money is evil and money is bad. You can believe money is evil and money is bad all you want. That's fine. Just give it all to us and we'll do what we need to do with it. Amen. Amen. But the truth is money is not evil. It's a seed. And some people eat all of their seed and have nothing left. 
But when you plant the word, the, the seed into the kingdom of God, you're planting it into good, fertile ground. And it's not even necessarily the kingdom of God, meaning the church. When you give to a friend, when you give to a family member, when you give to the church, when you give to, a, to someone you know who, who's in, in a time of need, you're giving to the kingdom of God. Jesus says, when you've ministered to the, broken, uh, to the brokenhearted, when you've ministered to the widows, when you've ministered to the poor, you've done it unto me. And they said, well, when have you been poor? When have you been a widow? When have you been any of these things? And Jesus says, when you've done it to the least of them, you've done it to me. In other words, whatever you do for people out of love, whether it's giving, whether it's helping, whether it's being there, you're doing it unto Jesus. That's the kingdom of God right there. So when you sow into a church, into a ministry, into the life of a friend, into the life of a child, that's the kingdom of God. Amen? And you can expect a harvest. In fact, you should expect a harvest or else you will never be able to help again. You should re expect to receive the harvest. Amen? There's one who scatters, but it increases more. But there's one who withholds more than is right, and it leads to poverty. Which one do you want to do? You, who wants to go to down the road of poverty? I almost had a hand go up because they didn't know what I was going to say. <laughs> No. Which one do you want to go down? The road that leads to increase or the road that leads to poverty? The road that leads to overflowing or the road that leads to barely enough? The road that leads to victory or the one that leads to defeat? Victory. victory. Then what's the prescribed method of increase? Say it with me. Scatter. Scatter. Give. The generous soul will be made rich. Praise God. Someone say, I'm rich this morning. I'm rich. Thank you, Lord. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy when we get to heaven. I'm going to see all the people who don't like giving and don't like riches. I wanna, I'm going to look at their face the moment they enter the pearly gates of heaven and see the gold streets, see the, the light posts that are made out of bricks of gold and diamonds and all of these precious things that people on this earth said are worthless and, and yucky and, and evil. They're in for a big surprise. God ain't cheap. He's not El Chipo. He's El Shaddai. He's more than enough. Amen. That's our good God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Again, it's all just for us to be able to be a blessing for other people. God wants us to bless others. And, and he, not only does he want you just to bless others, he wants you to want to bless others. He wants you to have a heart that says, you know what? I want to be able to help people get out of debt. I want to be able to pay someone's mortgage off, praise God. I want to buy someone a car. I want to give my car away, praise God. You know, giving something of value that much away, it brings, it, it gives you joy. I mean, I know firsthand, we gave our car away to someone, and it was, it was at first it was like, okay, this is a big thing right here. And we didn't have our baby yet. It was just me and Stephanie. We didn't really need the car, so we gave it away. And it, it brought them so much joy. It brought us so much joy. And now we're waiting for the next car to come so we can have one for the baby and then another car to come so we can give it away. Praise God. Heck, I'm in real estate. I'm trying to give away a house one of these days. Imagine that. Imagine, imagine someone knocking on your door going, hey, here's the title deed to a 500,000 house sitting on 10 acres. Wow, imagine that. The Bible says you're blessed when you receive, but you're more blessed when you give. You're more blessed, amen? Have I convinced you already? Let's go ahead and get in the offering, praise God. There's a couple ways you can give if you wanna give this morning. You can give online at deeprooted.church slash give. If you're watching online, you'd like to mail it in, you can mail it to PO Box 254. By Celia, California, 93279. Uh, you can also text to give. Just text any dollar amount on your smartphone to the number 84321. It'll go to the right spot. If you're giving in person, there's offering envelopes you can give with and the seats in front of you. If you don't see one, just ask an usher and, and they'll give one to you as well. Good things are happening though, church. I'm excited. I have a, I have a lot of joy for the future. The Bible says that Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. 
Whatever you're going through right now, know that there's something coming in the future for you. There's something good coming in the future for you. Keep that joy in the front of you, in your vision, and that'll get you through any trial that you are facing in life right now. Praise God. Let's go ahead and stand if we're going to give this morning. Thank you, Lord. Someone say, I'm rich. Thank you, Lord. Again, you can be rich in a lot of money. You can be rich in a lot of stuff. But if you're not rich in who you are in Christ, none of it matters. Being rich doesn't just mean money. The generous soul, it said, the generous soul will be made rich. If your soul is not rich, I don't care how much money you got in the bank. You're poor. Amen? The Bible also says that to, for, for you to be prosperous as well as your soul is prospering. If your soul's not prospering, you could have a million dollars in the bank and it means nothing. You could, have, you could have all the money in the world. It's not just about riches. There's a lot of celebrities who are rich, but they kill themselves. It's not about the money. It's about how your soul is prospering. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Father God, we just thank you for every gift and we thank you for every giver this morning. We call these seeds sown in the ministry blessed in Jesus' name. Lord, we know you are faithful you are faithful to provide. You are faithful to, to help us in a time of need, Father. You're faithful to give us wisdom and grace to be able to do things that we couldn't do before to be able to provide for our families, provide for our friends, and to be a big blessing to a lot of people. So, Father, we are so thankful this morning for what you've done, that your provision is here for us every single day. Every day we can expect to receive our daily bread, Father. We love you. We thank you. And all of God's people said, amen. amen, amen. Let's say this all together. Something good will happen today because he is good and his mercy endures forever. I will have abundance, all sufficiency, and more than enough because he is good and his mercy endures forever. He is my shepherd, I shall not want, because he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, because he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Ushers, go ahead. Thank you. Well, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Turn morning, you turn morning to dancing. You turn beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one you can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into eyes. Shout hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hey, well, it's a pleasure seeing you this morning. Before you get seated, go ahead and shake a, a hand, greet a neighbor, meet someone new for the first time, and then you'll be seated.
Well, good morning. Good morning, church. How are you doing today? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Who thanked the Lord the first time they, they stepped foot off their bed this morning? The first thing that day when they, when they got up today. Did you thank the Lord? Thank you, Lord. He is so good. You know, sometimes it's, it's hard to remember to thank the Lord when you're sleepy. And you wake up in the morning and you haven't had your coffee yet or... You, maybe you woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Amen. But make it a point every morning to thank the Lord for, for his mercy, his mercy and his grace. Praise God. I'm happy to be here today. We had a great Resurrection Sunday. If you were not here, let me tell you, you missed out. And everyone around you can attest to that. Amen. It was a great, great morning. We had just a fun, fun time and, and had a lot of faces in here, new faces in here, and some returning faces, so we're so happy to see you this morning, and it's just been a good time. Um, just so I, a uh, couple of announcements before we get on with the message today. Uh, we have a couple of books. This one is, uh, is God Out to Get Me. If this is your first time, if you've watched online for the first time, you can get one of these completely free, our way of saying thanks for stopping by today. Just see a, a service host at the end of service, and they'll be happy to assist you. And then this book, The Power of Purity, I wrote this, and this came out this past, uh, early this year, in January, and it's been a fantastic book. Um, I learned a lot while I was writing it, and just so, just so you can have some fun reading it, I have some pictures in here, too, for all of the people with short attention spans. Amen. There's, a, there's two pictures in this whole book, so you have to really work to find them. All right. But if you want one of these, just go ahead and see one of the service hosts at the end of service. And again, they'll be happy to assist you. Also, we have small groups happening every Wednesday night. We have a men's and a women's small group meeting at 6 p.m. every single Wednesday night. So they're continuing this week. It's going to be a good, serv- a good, uh, good small group. We're excited. We're almost done with, this, with the season. Uh, we'll, we'll have a couple of, about like a month or two, maybe two months left. And uh, then we'll, we'll take a break and start the next season. But small groups are continuing this Wednesday, 6 p.m. So if you want to be there, please be sure to make some plans. We'd love to see you there. We eat some good food. Man, last week was great food. We had some great food. We had chicken thighs, chicken breasts. We had some tri-tips, some chili, cornbread. Oh, man, it was good. So if you just want to go for the food, you're more than welcome to go for the food. Oh, you can't go to the food, the host said. You can go to the food. Because there's going to be some food after the food. Amen? Who's hungry this morning? You ready to eat some food today? Praise God. Before we get started, can we give our online audience one big round of applause for tuning in today? We're so glad you're able to tune on online. And if you haven't known, we have a podcast you can listen to on Spotify, iHeartRadio, anywhere you can find a podcast. So throughout the week, if you want to listen to the messages, they're available online as well as our YouTube channel and our website, deeprooted.church. You guys ready to receive the word today? I got a good word in my belly, and I believe it's going to do a, a lot of good stuff for you guys today. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 23. We'll start there today. Matthew chapter 23, we're continuing the power of purity. We took a couple of weeks off. Actually, we took one week off, I believe, for Easter, Resurrection Sunday. And uh, it was actually really good. The Lord is so good to orchestrate this this stuff. Um, Can I just be honest and transparent with you guys? I don't plan the message. I let the Lord plan the message for me. And I did not plan taking a break for Resurrection Sunday and coming back this Sunday, but it worked out perfectly because if you did not hear last week's message, this week's message is going to be a little rough for you to receive. Because last week, I talked about the goodness of God, talked about the love of God and how God loves you regardless of your, your conduct. God loves you regardless of what you do. You can't do anything to make God love you more, and you can't do anything to make God love you less. Someone say amen. Because if that were the case, there is no security in our salvation. 
it would be dependent on you. And that's what a lot of religions, a lot of religions have done in their doctrine is they've tried to make people believe that they have to do certain things in order to be right with God. Some would say that's wrong. That's wrong. It's not right. That's not how the Lord instituted the church to be. The church is not a religious organization. We are a relationship with Jesus Christ. He is our groom and we are the bride. God is our heavenly father and we are his sons who have been adopted into sonship. And we cry, Abba, Father. The word Abba, Father is literally translated Daddy God. I know, you're not going to like it. But that's what it means. He is our daddy. God is your daddy. And he's not this guy who's on a throne who's going to just strike you down because you did something wrong. He is your daddy and he loves you. And his arms are wide open waiting for you to come home to him. That's our good God. So regardless of your background, regardless of who you are, God loves you if you've received his son. Amen? That was a good place for you to say amen. Amen. So today, in light of what we spoke on last week, today... We get to the favorite part, purity in your conduct. Purity in your conduct. What does that mean, Matt? It means cleaning up your act. (laughs) Oh, but Matt, you're only supposed to preach on grace. I did last week. (laughs) All right. Here's the truth. You don't have to do any of this that I'm going to talk about today. And you'll still be loved by God. And there's the grace. But if you don't do these things, it's going to be a lot harder for you to love God. That's the whole purpose. So before we go any further, notice I'm talking about conduct at the tail end of the series. And if you were to talk about conduct at the front end of the series, it would be works. It would be legalism. It would be self-righteousness. Meaning, you got to do these things in order for God to love you, in order for God to fellowship with you. But that's not the truth either. Going back to the Garden of Eden, you know, there's a lot you can learn from the Bible. You should read it one of these days. But going back to the Garden of Eden, people think that God, the moment Adam and Eve sinned, God kicked them out of the garden because he was mad at them and because he he was putting his judgment on them. And then he stopped fellowshipping with them. People believe that. But the truth is, God removed them from the garden because the tree of life was still in the garden with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if they were to have partaken of the tree of life after sinning, they would live forever with sin, never seeing death, therefore never seeing redemption. So God, through his grace, removed them from the garden so they couldn't eat from the tree of life. Therefore, they could eventually die and be redeemed. Amen? That's grace. He didn't remove them because he was mad. He was protecting them. Then we see this story with their children, Cain and Abel. And Abel brings an offering to the Lord, which was pleasing to God and acceptable. Wait a minute. I thought God stopped fellowshipping with people. Why is Abel bringing an offering to God knowing it pleases him? That takes fellowship. That takes knowing who God is and what he likes. Amen? Then Cain brings an offering, and it wasn't the best. It wasn't out of a good heart. And he brings it before the Lord, and the Lord said, look at your brother Abel's offering. Look at his How did God tell Cain to look at Abel's offering if there's no fellowship? There's so many good things in here. And uh, it goes to show that God didn't just cut off communication with people because of sin. He still fellowship with people. His grace was still there regardless of their sin. Why? Because there was no law to impute the sin unto the people. Right? 
And then you have this fellowship with, with, with God and his people from Abraham establishing the Abrahamic covenant all the way up to when the law was established with Moses. Once the law came, the Bible says that God who was leading the people with, by a cloud by day and fire by night, the moment the law came, he separated himself and said, you can't even touch this mountain or else you will die. Then the law came. Then separation came. Then religion came. That was for 2,000 years. But after Jesus came, it's like it went back to the day of grace before the law was imputed. It was all grace before the law. And then now, since Jesus, it's been all grace. So nothing you do can stop God from loving you because grace has been imputed. Sin is not imputed. Grace is imputed. So... You do not have to do these things that we're going to talk about today, but it's to your advantage if you do. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Matthew chapter 23, verse 25. Matthew chapter 23, verse 25. The scripture says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Now, what's a hypocrite? It's pretty self explanatory. Someone who does something in, in one instance and then changes another instance. In other words, it's someone who, who says they're, they're one way, but then they act a different way. Someone who puts a, a, a facade on. In fact, the, the translation for hypocrite in the Greek actually talks about a hypocrite being an actor. Someone who, and back in, this day, in those days, whenever you'd be, you're an actor, you would wear these, these masks to portray different characters. So someone who literally has a mask on one moment and then takes the mask off in another moment. That's a hypocrite, two-faced. And Jesus is calling these scribes and these Pharisees and these religious leaders hypocrites. But to put in perspective, that's like like you going to a really famous church and going up to the pastor and going, you hypocrite. And people do that all the time, but they do it in, in, in bad taste. But that's what Jesus was doing. He said, you hypocrites. And what was the purpose of him calling him a hypocrite? He says, for you clean the outside of a cup and the dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, verse 26. First, clean the inside of the cup and the dish that the outside of them may be clean also, someone say, thank God for his word. He said, first clean the inside, then clean the outside. He was telling the Pharisees, you take care of the stuff on the outward first before you take care of the inside first. You know what that's called today? Behavior modification. That's called going to some psychologist or going to some group that says, you know what? You might be an alcoholic on the inside for the rest of your life, so you just probably never should drink alcohol again because you're never gonna change. Just stop the outward action, and then the inside, you don't have to deal with it ever again. That's behavior modification, because they're trying to change the behavior of a person before they change the heart of a person. And that's what this whole entire series has been about, the power of purity. It's been inside out transformation. Starting first with the inside, then changing the outside. Because here's the truth, it's a lot easier to start evaluating and changing your outward stuff when your inside's clean. It's a lot easier. It's a lot harder trying to change the outside stuff first when you have no change on the inside. There's no life on the inside. It's just you're always gonna have to be upkeeping the outside because the inside is still filthy. Thank you, Lord. So Jesus said, first clean the inside, then the outside may become clean. Religion is outward focused. It's man trying to approach God based on conduct. That's religion. It's outward focused. It's people saying, God, if I do good enough stuff, then will you bless me? It's outward focused. Relationship with Jesus or Christianity is God 
coming to man, saying, regardless of the things you do, I'm going to come to you, near to you, and I'm going to establish a relationship with you through my son Jesus. That's relationship. It's Christianity right there. Not religion. Because it's impossible to change someone's heart and have it not change the outward stuff. It's nearly impossible to have something going on on the inside and have it not reflect on the outside. There's a lot of things that that happen in marriages and they happen in friendships and there's a lot of uh, arguments or fallouts or divorces that'll happen. And really, it's not necessarily anything that someone did outwardly. Sure, the spouse might have had an affair or someone was unfaithful, or, or they just grew apart from each other. Absolutely, those are all outward things, but I can guarantee you 100% of the time, it all started on the inside of each person. Every time. Maybe, and here's a, a real world example, there's people who are in marriages and they watch these TV shows like Game of Thrones and all these, these shows that have nudity and sex in them, and then it gets these people watching this and they start thinking oh i want that i how come my life can't be like that how come our relationship can't be that good and then they start thinking well what if i was with someone else well what if i was with that actor well what if i have my five celebrity crushes that if i wasn't married i could have a night with them and there's actually people who have those scenarios and fantasies of these celebrities that if i wasn't married and i saw them in public i would have i would be with them as married people, and that starts in the heart, and over time, they start, that starts to grow and grow and grow to the point where it's just, oh, well, we grew apart. Did you? Did you really? I wonder why. And that's, the, that's a, a sad reality because it happens to a lot of people, and it all started on the inside. It had nothing to do with the outward stuff. It's what they allowed on the inside. Because there was a point in a marriage where there was hardship and then there was struggles and then there was things, but they stuck it through it because they loved each other. But then all of a sudden, all of a sudden life got hard, life started throwing blows at them and it just became too hard. It's because something entered the heart. That's one example for marriage. There's many examples for everything else. Every issue that you have in life begins in the heart. You ever see the movie, How the Grinch Stole Christmas? And I'm talking about the old one, the one that, uh, that who, who, who wrote, who designed it? Yeah, it was a Dr. Seuss one. Uh, Chuck Jones was the illustrator. And it was this, this doctor, it was this uh, Grinch Stole Christmas cartoon. And the Grinch would have like a little x-ray and it would show his heart. And it was a little, little, little heart. And because his heart was two times too small, it, he had this hatred towards all the Who's who lived down in Whoville, right? But at the very end of the movie, if you remember, his heart got huge and huge and kind of concerningly big. And it got really big to the point where he wanted to save Christmas for everyone. What happened? A change of heart. It began in the heart. And I know it's such a simple illustration using the Grinch, but that's how simple it is. It's, it's actually so simple that it's, it's hard to miss it, but everyone does. Yep. It's real simple. And everything that we deal with will start in the heart. Thank you, Lord. But religion will deal with the outward first, not on the inside. It's works-based. It's do everything that you can to please God, and then hopefully he'll hear you. Hopefully he'll listen to you. And they'll pray Old Testament prayers that says, if, if your people who are called by your name would humble themselves and do all of this, then God would heal their land. So that was an Old Testament scripture, Jethro. <laughs> Old Testament prayer. The truth is, God's already healed whatever you need to be healed, whether it's your land, whether it's your country, whether it's your home. God's already healed it regardless of what you've done, but what's keeping it from being, um, from that healing from coming is you letting the enemy in. That's the difference. It has nothing to do with God. In fact, we should be praying if God's people who are called by his name would humble themselves, then they'd defeat the enemy and they'd have their land healed. Amen. That's an appropriate prayer for this side of the cross. 
So it has nothing to do with what God's done. Religion, though, is trying to get you into a place of, of working as hard as you can just to make God love you and heal you and help you. That's works. Don't get mad at me for this. This was a joke that I heard. And uh, it, it went like this. It said, Mary had a little lamb. It would have been a sheep. But then it joined the Baptist church and died from lack of sleep. <laughs> I didn't make it up. I just heard it from someone else who was once a Baptist and was in that denomination of works mentality of working your way for God to love you. You'll never get there. Because in yourself, you're filthy. Your righteousness, your own works is a filthy rags. But thank God, someone say thank God. God. We're never without him, praise God. He's always with us, empowering us, loving us, and keeping us on the right track. But in yourself, apart from him, you can do nothing. You cannot please him. You cannot make God love you more. You can't make God mad at you. He loves you because of what Jesus did, not because of what you do. Matthew chapter 23, we'll keep going in verse 27. Jesus went on to say again, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. You know what a whitewashed tomb is? People will pay all this money for a beautiful headstone at the cemetery, but then like right six feet under just fill the dead man's bones. They try to make the tombstone look really pretty and the headstone really pretty, but the reality is you dig six feet down and it's, it's ugly down there. That's what he was saying that the Pharisees were like. He's saying, you guys are like the tombs. They're, they're, you're dead on the inside. But sure, you have a nice, pretty little tomb, but you're dead. I was watching HGTV with my wife the other night, and we were watching the show Flip or Flop. And there was this one, sh- one home that they went to. A lot of times, investors will buy houses sight unseen, meaning they can't see the inside of the house until they get the keys. So they bought the home without seeing the inside because the home looked nice on the outside. And they thought, well, maybe it won't be that bad of a flip because it looks nice on the outside. But lo and behold, they opened the door and it was a disaster all throughout the inside. And even the person said on the show, it goes to show that you, it doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside because the inside might be disgusting. That's exactly what Jesus said. It doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside if the inside is not clean. But that's unfortunately how a lot of people are living their lives. People are are trying to clean up the outward part of their their selves before they they come to God, thinking that if I just clean my outward, then God will love me. If I just stop smoking or stop drinking or stop partying or stop this and that, then I can come to church. But that's all outward stuff. Guess what? A week later, you're going to go right back to that stuff because nothing on the inside changed. Nothing on the inside changed. But when you start dealing with the inside first and addressing the root of those things, oh, it's so much more easy to break off old habits. So much more easier. I'll give you another example. Um, There was a time where I was really into fitness and working out, and I wanted to to look like a certain celebrity because they looked really cool. And I was like, yeah, I want my jacket to pop out and my arms to be big and my chest to be big. And then I became a dad. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I wanted to look like this athlete or this actor. And he, he, was, he was preparing his body for a boxing role. And so he had to look like a boxer, a really chiseled guy. Ever seen Sylvester Stallone and Rocky? Like that kind of like chiseled. And I wanted to look like that. And... It wasn't so much more, well, for me, it was all outward stuff. I didn't want to look like that because my health would improve. I wanted to look like that because I wanted to look good and look fit and look strong, regardless if I was actually healthy or not. And I did it for a while. I was on this this workout routine for a while. But then after some time, I just fell off of it and never got back to it. Why? It wasn't in here. It was just out here. And I got tired of it, didn't want to do it anymore. Um, but then there was another point in time where my, my beautiful wife was just a friend. And I was in a friend zone for a long time. 
And the, the year before, or actually the year we, we kind of started dating and talking, um, we, we had went out for lunch, and she told me that she was vegan and weird stuff like that. And then I, I was like, okay, well, if she's, if she's vegan, I th- I'll, I'll try going vegetarian then. So I went vegetarian for a while, and it was pretty fun. And then I went full on vegan. And we were vegans together. We would make vegan mac and cheese and vegan uh, hot wings and stuff like that. Actually, it was pretty good. I'm not going to lie. And uh, we, I got to the point where, where we were full on vegans, and, and we didn't really desire to eat meats and eggs and dairy and all that stuff. But I stuck with it. Why? Because she was in my heart. And I wanted to impress her. And then once I got her, I quit. I stopped all that stuff. (laughs) Got to be honest. And now we eat steak, fish, hamburgers, all that stuff. And I feel more healthier now than I did back then. The point is, though, it was, it was something that was in my heart that I wanted to do, because not for the outward benefits, but because she was in my heart now, and I wanted to impress her. I wanted her to be drawn to me. I, I wanted us to have that connection, so I did those things, right? It doesn't matter what you do on the outward if it's not on the inside first. And when you have a relationship with Jesus and you love him and you're in his word and you're studying it and you're in fellowship with him, All the outward things are going to come naturally. All the the refraining from this and stop that, they'll come naturally. In fact, my wife and I, we had a a broadcast we did a couple years ago on this topic of relationships and abstaining from certain uh, sexual impurities. And she had said something so beautifully. She said, it's not just refraining from sex and, and not doing this because that's all works. It's, it's more a heart issue. Why do I want to refrain from this? Why do I want to not have sex with my, with my boyfriend until we get married? Why do I want to do that? Not just to do it because the Bible says so or my parents said so. That works. It's going to be a lot harder, and it is a lot harder for couples to refrain when there's nothing on the inside making them want to. It's just an outward because we have to. It's a lot harder. But when you have it on the inside, because I know that marriage is sacred, and I know that that bond between two people is sacred, and I only want to share it with my spouse, when you have that rooted on the inside of you, it's so much easier to wait. It's not easy. It's easier. <laughs> and, and you have to get it on the inside first before you start doing things on, on the outside. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 8, for those of you who don't know, this is kind of our the church's foundation right here. And it says, For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spread out its roots by the river, and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. That's what we decided a long time ago that deep-rooted church would be founded on. We would be founded on, on Jeremiah 17, 8, as a tree that's near the water that spread out its roots will never be afraid of the season of drought, but will be yielding fruit all of the time. The, 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 there's so much significance in here. The, the river that the tree is planted by is symbolizing Jesus, the living water. And the tree that's planted near the living water and spread its roots to the living water will never run dry, will never experience drought. Why? Because the tree's so good? No, because it's near the living water. It's rooted deep in living water. Then that, That's where our name came from, deep rooted. We were going to be trees deeply rooted near the living water. See... The, the, and, and what happens is the outward of the tree, in other words, the fruit, you with me? The fruit of the tree is symbolizing what's taken place in the roots. The fruit of that, living, of that tree that never experiences a drought, that never experiences a, 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 a season without a harvest, the, the root of it is in the living water. 
That's why it's able to, to have such a, a fruitful life because it's planted by the water. And when you plant yourself in God's word, when you get yourself planted in the living water, you shouldn't have to experience a life of, of no power. You shouldn't be experiencing powerless, sick, empty, depressed, oppressed lives. That shouldn't be the Christian life. But it is because people aren't planted near the streams of water. They're planted somewhere else, and then occasionally they'll uproot the plant and plant near the water and then go back to where they came from. But the Christian life was never intended for us to live defeated. We were never supposed to live life empty, alone, sick. That was a good place to say amen. We had one person. But it happens because we're not planted near the living water. The, the, there's nothing that's going to affect the outward fruit, if that makes sense. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. That's the true definition of inside-out life change. Being planted near the living water where your roots and your leaf will be green and you won't be afraid of the year of drought because you will always produce fruit. Going back to Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said this to the Pharisee. He gave an order of operation. He said, first, clean the inside of the cup. And that's what we've done for the past 10, 11 weeks. We talked about the spirit, how your spirit is pure and perfect. Then we talked about the soul, renewing your mind, getting your mind in alignment with God's mind, cleaning that junk out of your mind. Then... The next step is the outward. And Jesus said, clean first the inside so that the outward may become clean. In other words, it's, so, it's, it's almost automatically. It's almost automatically when you start to put things on the inside of you and from God's word, it's like these changes will automatically start to come. That's right. like, you don't have to struggle to do it. It just happens. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Because the truth is, holiness and holy living should be the fruit of your relationship with Christ, not the root. Amen. That's right. That's right. Holiness should be the fruit, not the root. I don't get drunk because of my relationship with Christ. I don't have an affair with my wife because of my relationship with Christ. Not, I don't have an affair so that it doesn't affect it, my relationship with Christ. It's because my relationship with Christ is so good and I know what he's freed me from and I know what he's empowered me to do. Because of that, I don't even want to do those other things. It's not that I don't want to do those things because I don't want the consequences. That's also there. But the main reason why I don't want to do it is because I just have no desire. I have no desire to do those things because the Bible says that God will give you the desires of your heart. When you seek God first, he will give you the desires of your heart. In other words, he will put desires in your heart. When you seek the Lord with all of your heart, and lean not on your own, own understanding and acknowledge his ways. And all of you do, he'll direct your path. He'll give you the desires of your heart. I don't know how I can explain this even better. That's like me saying, here, here's your desires. These are yours now. That's what God does. When you seek him first, when you submit to his will, when you submit to his desires, his desires become your desires. Your desires will never become his desires, but his desires will become your desires. Does that make sense? And so because of this relationship with him, I don't desire to live in sin. I don't desire to cheat on my spouse. I don't desire to do drugs because of him, not because I fear the consequence because you, there's a lot of loopholes to consequences. You can, you can dodge consequences if you want to. I can hide a bunch of stuff if I'd like to. I, I, can, I can have an affair and hide it if I want to. There's no consequence there. But 
I don't do that because of the consequences. I refrain from it because my relationship with Jesus is stronger. And he gives me desires of my heart. Thank you, Lord. Bear with me. I'm trying to think of any more ways to, that the Lord's trying to explain it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Proverbs 4.23, we don't have it on the screen, but I'll just read it. It says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Every issue of life that you have is, is stemmed from the heart. Like I said earlier, with, the, uh, with marriage or with just issues, it didn't just appear on the outward. You didn't just wake up and go, uh-oh, I had an affair. Yikes. It started in your heart at some point. Whether it was getting too emotionally close to someone at one point, that starts in the heart. And then it works its way outward. I hope you're seeing this, church. Because everything you do starts in the heart. Living holy does not make God love us more. It helps us love God more. Living holy does not, does not reveal God to us it, it's not like we live holy and then God says, here I am. Now I can have a relationship with you. Living holy clears the mud from your eyes. God's been there the whole time, but because your eyes have been so fogged up with junk and mud and impurity, you couldn't see him. So when you live a holy life, you're cleaning your vision to see him. That's why I say you don't have to do these things. God still loves you. You're still going to heaven. God is never going to be mad at you, but it'll hinder the way you see God and the way you love God and how you receive from God. It has everything to do with you. Today's service is all about you. Enjoy it because it'll never have another service like this. <laughs> Praise God. First Timothy chapter three, turn there really quick before it leaves says, this is a faithful saying. You guys didn't catch that joke. It'll, it'll come later. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, see, all of our serve team leaders, they know this scripture. This is everyone who joins our serve team knows this. And this is how we conduct our serve team. This is how we conduct the leadership of the church. It says, if anyone wants to be a bishop, or in other words, a leader, he desires a good work. Verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless. And that's where about every Christian shuts their Bible and says no more. Because they get afraid of that word blameless, meaning I can't make any mistakes. I can't do anything wrong. If I do something wrong, uh-oh, I'm, I'm done. That's not what that means. The word blameless in the King James Version of the Bible, it says above reproach. That a leader must be above reproach. What does above reproach mean? It means without question. It means someone who has so much integrity about them that, that no one will question their motives. No one will question their actions. No one will question their whereabouts. What was so-and-so doing over there? Why was he over there? It's above reproach. And this is what turns off a lot of people from even coming to church because Although it's talking about a person desiring the position of a bishop or a leader, this even goes to Christians, all Christians. Because if you're a believer, you're a leader. There, is not, there should not be a single believer who's a follower. Every believer should be a leader, not a follower. We don't follow the ways of the world. We lead people to Christ. Amen? We are leaders. We only follow him, but we lead people to him. Amen? Amen? So if you're a believer, this applies to you. Someone say, uh-oh. Again, none of these things that we're going to discuss right now affect the way God loves you. Praise God. This is for your benefit. This is for the people around you to benefit from as well. So he says first, someone say blameless. blameless. Husband of one Wife, you would think that's pretty easy to follow. Temperate, 
In other words, self-controlled, not quick to get angry. Sober-minded, in other words, thinking clearly. Of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not covetous. Those are a lot of stuff, right? A lot of things right there. Again, these aren't laws. They're not even commands. They're instructions for leaders. If you want to be a leader, do these things. And that's leadership material. But these aren't the the Ten Commandments. These aren't the commands, and if you break them, you're going to hell. That's not what these are. They're for your benefit. They're instructions to help you live a life above reproach. If, If anything, we can... We can just not read those and just read a bishop must be above reproach. End of discussion. That's all we need to know. But then it lists, okay, well, how do I become above reproach? Be the husband of one wife. Be faithful to one spouse. Don't be a drunkard. Don't be greedy for money. Those are ways to be above reproach. Are you following? Because there's a lot of stuff. And Jesus, he, he really simplified all of it. In the New Testament, when he was talking and, and they were asking him, what's the greatest commandment out of all the billion commandments that we've made up? What's the greatest commandment? And he said, the greatest one of all is to love the Lord your God. That's number one. And the second is like it, he said, love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, if you wouldn't do it to yourself, you shouldn't do it to someone else. If you wouldn't steal money from you, you shouldn't do it to anyone else. If you wouldn't cheat, if you don't want someone to cheat on your spouse or you to cheat on some, how do I say that? If you don't want your spouse to cheat, then you don't cheat because you love yourself regardless how you, of what you think of yourself. You love yourself. Whether you're depressed, lowly, down, sad, you love yourself. That's just a human fact. Because you wouldn't dare to do those things to yourself because you love yourself. And so that's what he was saying. Because you love yourself so much, this is pretty much easy for you to follow. Love someone just as much as you love yourself. It doesn't say go, go find self-help and self-care before you help others. That's not what he was saying. He's saying you, you love yourself pretty good. So love yourself as, or love your neighbors like you love yourself. And if you truly loved your neighbor, I wouldn't go have an affair with his wife. If I truly loved my neighbor, I wouldn't take more money than I should. If I truly loved my neighbor, I wouldn't lie to them. If I truly loved my neighbor, I wouldn't murder them. Amen? Amen. So Jesus said, all of the laws can be summed up with love God and love people. Because if you do those two things, you'll have no desire to break the other laws. And that's the whole purpose of all this. So really, again, this can be said, if you love people, if you love your neighbor, then you wouldn't, you wouldn't try to steal their, their spouse. If you love your neighbor, you wouldn't get so easily offended at people. If you love your neighbor, you'd be sober-minded. You wouldn't be jumping to conclusions all the time. If you love your neighbor, you'd behave good around them. It's real simple. It takes a good theologian to make you confused about this stuff. Thank you, Lord. But he he goes on. He lists all those other things. And again, being blameless is just being above reproach without question. Anyone like boxing in here? Watching the sport, not actually doing it? Well, I grew up a little past uh, Iron Mike Tyson's prime. And so I would watch reruns of his fights. And I would watch them at my grandparents' house. They had Comcast back in the day. And they had this little section to watch historical fights. And so I would watch all of his, watch a couple of Muhammad Ali's. And there was always this, this trend with him. Every time I would watch his fights, while he was still a young, a young fighter, he would knock out every single opponent within two rounds. And the fight would be over like that. It was like a, a waste of people's money to go watch it. And he was just so dominant in the field of boxing that to the point where he fought this guy, Trevor Burbick, for the first time, knocked him out, and claimed his first heavyweight title. After he claimed that title, he went on to fight another person, claim another title, fought another person, claim another title. He had many titles to his name. Why? He was so good. 
So good. I don't care what you think about the guy now. He was a great fighter. And he might not have the best morals. He might not have the best ethics. He might not be the best person. But when he was in the ring, without a doubt, without a question, he was the best fighter ever. And the trend was, after he got all those titles, the announcer would always turn to the corner, in the red corner, weighing 200 and something pounds from Catsfield, New York, the Iron Mike Tyson. But he would always call him the undisputed, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, Iron Mike Tyson. You know what that word undisputed means? Without question. Meaning without question, he's the heavyweight champion of the world. Without a doubt, he is the greatest fighter we've seen today. And that's that word, un, without question, that should be us. When people look at us, without a doubt, I know he's a good guy. Without a doubt, I know he has, good, uh, has a good uh, head on his shoulders. Without a doubt, I know he'll make the right decisions all the time. That should be believers. That should be our title, the undisputed good person. Again, it has nothing to do with you and God. It has everything to do with you and other people. He goes on and he says this in, in verse 4. He continues to list more rules and he's, or instructions. He says, One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. See, work should never, ever, ever go above family. Never. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your situation says. Work should never be above your family, ever. And I'll just be honest and transparent with you. For me and my house, God's my number one, and my family's my number two, and everything else is number three. I don't care what happens in this world. If my family, and I'm, talk, I'm talking about me, Stephanie, and my son, Matthew. My family, if something's happening with that, I will forsake this place in a heartbeat. If the Lord, if, if something's happening with my family, and I'm not taking care of it, I'm not doing this. I will not be up here preaching. I will not be up here leading because I'm not leading my family. I'm a hypocrite. He says, if your family must be in order before you take care of other things. Well, Matthew, God called you to pastor. Absolutely. But he first called me to be her spouse. He first called me to multiply. He first called me to take care of my family. That's my first priority, my first ministry over anything else. I will not let my family get destroyed for the sake of this church growing. I will not do it. I don't care how much money comes in that offering envelope. I don't care how many people sit in here. Praise God it's growing, but we have people in place to do it if I can't do it. It's not my organization. I just work here. I'm not the boss. But I have a priority to my family first. <clears throat> he goes on in verse 5. He says, if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church? So there's my proof. There's my support right there. Verse 6, not a novice. In other words, not a recent convert, not a, a new born again believer, lest he be puffed up with, with pride and he falls into the same condemnation as the devil. In other words, he falls into the same trap that the devil fell into, which was pride. Pride, thinking that you're better than God, you know everything and all of that. He's saying you cannot be a novice. You can't be a, a recent convert. And people don't like that either. They don't, they don't understand. They just try to throw the grace card at that. But let me just be clear with you. If, if you were someone who recently got convicted of a crime for, for theft, but then you gave your life to the Lord, praise God, but you're not going to be church treasurer. I don't care who you are. Give you about 10 years and maybe. It's not because there's no grace for you, but because the reality is just because God loves you and has grace for you, it doesn't mean you get the same 
benefits in the world that everyone else does. That's just the truth. Because it goes all back to integrity. If you are known for, for being a liar, if you are known for, for just stretching the truth, chances are you're never going to be up here to speak about anything. I don't care if you're a believer. It's not because God doesn't love you or God can't use you. That's what you're known for. That's your reputation. And it goes on to say this. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he falls into the reproach and the snare of the devil. If people know you for something, regardless if, if you're freed from it or not, you can't just automatically assume you're going to jump into that office of, of ministry. Amen? Amen? That's just not wise. Because it ruins the reputation of all the people supporting what you're doing. How would you feel if I hired a church treasurer who was just convicted of stealing money like a month ago, but gave his life to the Lord since then? How would you feel about that? How would you feel about my judgment on that? You'd question it. So this falls on me to make the right judgment, but it also falls on, on the people to judge me about that too. See, there's a, there's, there's, it's like a domino effect of consequences that we have to be careful with. Again, God is not even in the picture. He loves you. He cares for you. He has grace for you. He has mercy for you. This has uh, everything, everything to do with how we interact with people, our conduct with people. And when we are wholly living and we're following these instructions, it helps us see things so much more clearly. It helps us judge things a lot more clearly. Amen? It's for your benefit. That's all it is for. I read verse 7, but I want to read it again. Verse 7, he says, Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside. In other words, he has to have a good reputation with the unbelievers. He has to have a good reputation with people who are not Christ followers. Why? Because there's so many people in the church today that the unbelievers hate because they're always pointing the finger. You got to stop doing this or else God won't love you. You're going to hell. You need to stop doing this. Stop sinning. Stop blah, 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 and, and all of that. And people don't like the church because of those people, the people who condemn the people who judge, the people who are mean to other to non-believers just because they don't believe in Jesus. Let me give you a good advice that I learned from Brother Keith Moore. Don't you ever let an unbeliever tell you that Jesus is supposed to be loving. Never let an unbeliever ask you if Jesus was supposed to be loving because that means they know that there's a characteristic of Christianity that you're not displaying. If an unbeliever calls you unloving, you've done something wrong. Now, I said all of that walking on a tightrope. Let me reel it back. This does not mean to be conformed to the world. There is a big distinction between being conformed of the world and living in the world. We live in the world, we're not of the world. You've heard that before. Jesus sat with sinners. He didn't sin with sinners. Big difference. But yet people will throw that out the door and say, well, we got to be, we got to relate to them and we got to be just like them and we got to party with them and we got to have church in a bar. Not, no opinion there, I'm just saying. But they try, to, they, they try to relate to the unbelievers so much that they literally just become them in their action. And that's not what we're supposed to do either, because then there's no difference between us and them. There's absolutely no difference. So it's understanding that, yes, we're, ha we're supposed to have a good reputation, a good rapport with unbelievers, but still demonstrating and displaying the light and the love of God. That's what we're supposed to be doing to people. Hmm. Think what you want about certain ministers but there is this one minister that I absolutely love. And I don't, I don't listen to him for doctrinal truth and theological wisdom. I listen to him for encouragement. And that's all I need. I, I have other people I listen to for, for doctrinal truth. But if I want to listen to someone who's encouraging, 
I'll turn him on and I'll listen to him because that's what his message is about. It's encouragement. And he reaches millions of people every day just by encouraging them. That's his call. That's his ministry. And praise God for it because most of the church is condemning people. I, exactly. Preach it, son. It's my boy right there. He got it. Thank you, Lord. I'd rather listen to someone who encourages and barely dives an inch deep in the Bible than someone who condemns people using all of the Bible. Praise God. The point is I'm trying to make is people are watching us all the time. Whether you like it or not, whether you want them to or not, people are constantly watching you. And the moment you say, I'm a Christian, they're watching even more. One of two reasons. Either they're watching you to, to wait for you to make a mistake, to call you out. That's out of your control. We make mistakes and people are just going to do that. Or they're watching you because they actually want to see how your life is different. They, they actually want to learn something. Why is this guy so happy? Why is he never upset? I've never seen him call in a sick day. What in the world? That's, that's another reason why they're watching you. Either they're going to call you out. If they do, let them. That's fine. But then there's others who are actually trying to learn. And they want to see what makes him so different. And that's where, the, that's where we come in. That's where we introduce them. It's not me. It's, it's, it's the Lord doing this through me. It's my relationship with Jesus that enables me to do this. But people are going to watch you no matter what you feel about that. I remember this, this celebrity about a couple of years ago. He just, like, decided he wasn't famous anymore. Remember that? There was a celebrity who, who just came out publicly and said, I'm not famous anymore. You can't do that. <laughs> You're going to be famous whether you want to be famous or not. And the same thing with you, church. You can't just say, no one watch me. No one can watch my life. People are going to watch your life. They're going to see how you respond to things. They're going to see how you treat people. They're going to see how you are in the world, and that's going to gauge whether or not they want to join. That's going to determine if they want a part of what you have. And if you're showing people what the world's already showing them, then there's no reason for them to want to jump ship and join what we have. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If the band can come back up, I'm almost done. <clears throat> In 1 Timothy chapter uh, 3, verse 14, this is, this is just a little later after all of his instructions. He said this. This is the reason why he wrote all of this to, to young Timothy. This was Paul writing a letter to Timothy. He said, this is why I wrote this to you. Though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in church. I wrote this so you know how to act in the house of God. And this is my favorite part, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. The New, New International Version says the pillars and the foundation of truth. In other words, Every single truth that the world claims to have came from here. They might twist it, manipulate it, make it how they want to. Has anyone ever sat in a business ethics seminar? Maybe at your job, your HR rep was there and they would teach you about ethics. And they say, it's wrong to steal pencils from the break room, or it's wrong to take the milk home from the refrigerator, or it's wrong to do these ethics, right? Well, if I'm not mistaken, 
I think there's somewhere in the Bible that says thou shalt not steal. You see, regardless if the world will acknowledge it or not, every ethic, every morally correct thing that the world has tried to introduce as theirs, they stole it from here. Everything. Regardless if they believe it or not, it doesn't mean it's not true. It just means that they're ignorant of it. But they took it from the word of God. They took it from the church and they've made it a truth. But that scripture literally was saying that the church of God, deep rooted church, the church of God as a global church, we are the foundation of truth. We are the pillar of truth. And if we aren't displaying what the Bible is saying, if we're not nice to people, if we're not displaying truth to people, no one is. No one is. We are the pillar and the foundation of truth. And if we don't show them the truth, who will? See, I told you that this was all about you today. I lied. <laughs> Although you're discussed a lot in here, this has everything to do with your effect on others. And as your pastor, as the leader of this church, it makes me happy when I see our congregation displaying the word of God to people, showing the love of God to people, because this is our church. Now it makes me unhappy when I see people in our church displaying the opposite, getting angry at people, getting mad at people, uh, or, or I don't know, just doing things that they're not, that they know they shouldn't be doing, but they just do it anyways. And that gets me upset because now, we have so-and-so who doesn't go to church because the church is full of hypocrites. Look at our church body going, oh, they're just like everyone else. Why would I go there? And now that's one less person who can come here. Now we have to understand, you're not in control of what people think and what people say and what people do. You're only in control of you. You're in control of what you do. Now, if you're someone who deals with, with guilt <clears throat> from other people, if you're so, um, how do I say? If you're so worried about what people think about you to the point where you're just always nervous and you're just always in, in this weird mindset, you need to be free from that. I don't care what people think about me when I'm doing what I know I'm supposed to do. I only care when I know I did something that I shouldn't have done and now I hope that they didn't see that, right? But when I'm following what I'm supposed to do, if someone judges me for it, sure, that's fine. It comes with the job, but it only concerns me when I know that, man, I lost my temper with this person. Darn it. I hope that they don't write me off. That's where I start to get concerned. You know what I mean? Don't be worried about what people think about you all the time because that will lead you down a road of, of a, a place you don't wanna go. But also, don't just not care about what people think about you either because then you're gonna be giving a bad report you're gonna be showing a bad example of what the church is really supposed to be to other people, amen? I leave you with these things right here. He, Paul wrote in Ephesians, he said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy. Someone say worthy. Walk worthy of the calling that you were called with all loneliness and all gentleness and long suffering, bearing with, with another, one another love, 
endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. He said, walk worthy of your calling. That word worthy means of value, meaning walk like you value your calling. Walk as if you value what God has done for you. Value it. And when you value it, you'll be careful on how your conduct is with people because you would never want someone to to not value what you value, right? Thank you, Lord. I value my father. He's been a great father to me. He's been really great to me and to my sister and to everyone. Everyone that he runs into somehow loves him. And in fact, like everywhere we go, I run run into someone who knows him. (laughs) And they just love him. I value him. It would be a shame if I went around devaluing what he's done for people by talking bad about him or doing things that aren't necessary. I would hate to put him to shame because of what I've done. Why? Because I value what he did in my life. I value how he raised me. I value the things that I have because of him, the, the characteristics that I have because I'm his blood. I value those things. And I would hate to put to shame those things because I wasn't careful. Even more, I would hate to put to shame what the cross did for me because I'm just not careful. Value your calling and you'll be sure to protect it. Thank you, Lord. Did my iPad die? I guess I'm done. I'm not joking, it's it's dead. It said, you're going too long. Hey, I never finish, I just quit. Then I'll continue, I'll continue next week or something. Throw the last scripture up there really quick. The very last one. Thank you, Lord. All right. Oh, there it is. Yeah, go, go back. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to live in sin that grace may abound? What's the answer, church? No. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many as of us as we're baptized into Christ Jesus, we're baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. Praise God. In other words, why would you continue just to live in sin? knowing what Jesus did for you. Why would you? It makes no sense. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Why would you live your old life when God has given you a brand new life? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Stand on your feet this morning. thank you Lord did you receive something today thank you Lord give God God a hand clap of praise let him know you're thankful thank you Lord aren't you glad today that none of this affects how God sees you doesn't affect how God loves you but it affects how you love him and how you see him amen father god we just thank you this morning for your word we thank you for this time that we've had together in fellowship and for you always being faithful to keep your promises father thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us but you've given us grace every day to make a mistake and still be in right standing with you father there's no other religion that has that 
No other religion is, is so good to, to say that we're always in right standing. You're the only God, the only supreme God that says, although you've made mistakes, my son already paid for it. And I can have a relationship with you once again. So Father, we are so thankful this morning for you and for your grace and for your love. I pray over every person in this room today that they would have a new revelation of your love, that they would have a revelation so, so grand, Father, that it would just ignite a fire to want to live a holy life, not because of the, the repercussions or the consequences, but because they just love you so much, it overflows into their actions, Father. Lord, we thank you every day for what you've done on the inside of us, for helping us with this inside-out transformation. And God, we thank you for purifying our hearts, purifying our spirit, Lord, from the very beginning and giving us a brand new, perfect, righteous spirit that can relate to you once again. We love you, Jesus. We say all these things in your son's name. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Don't forget, yeah, give the Lord a hand, clap of praise. Don't forget, Wednesday nights, our small groups, men's and women's small groups at 6 p.m. This Wednesday, continuing on. We would love to have you join if you haven't joined it yet. Again, there's good food and there's a good word that's gonna be shared in both of the groups. It's gonna be a good time. Uh, dedic uh, not dedication, child dedications, yes. Sunday, April 23rd. If you haven't put it in your calendar, I believe that's next Sunday. So be here, it's gonna be a good time. We're gonna have a couple of kids be dedicated before the Lord. It's gonna be a very precious, precious time. And we love to see everyone here in support. Other than that, I don't believe we have any more announcements. Uh, I think we're okay. We have, uh, those are the only things I have. So until we see you again, I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I pray that whatever you set your hands to do will prosper in Jesus' name, that you remember you're the head and not the tail. You are up front and not lagging behind. You are above always and never beneath in Jesus' name. I pray you continue living in the victory and remember you are always welcome here in our family of faith. God bless you guys. We'll see you again next week. If you need prayer at all, there's prayer ministers at the front. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in today. Consider subscribing to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any other videos that we post here. Also, share this with a friend so that they too can hear the gospel of grace. Don't forget, every Sunday and every Friday, you can tune in live with us as we study the word of God together.